Well, spring season is upon us, and with spring brings the gobble, gobble, gobble in the turkey <laughs> woods. Uh, it's starting to become a bigger part of culture in Alberta and British Columbia. Like we're understanding what generations of of folks in the eastern United States have grown to love and associate with their springtime in, in the woods is is calling it the turkey woods. I call it the turkey woods in the springtime. It's the elk woods in the fall and the, and the turkey woods in, in the springtime. Uh, I just, I like that. I like that word. So i um, super excited to uh, kind of catch up on, uh, on what all things turkeys in, in Alberta. So uh, folks, this is uh, Doug Manzer, uh, your senior scientist. Is that correct? With the Alberta Conservation Association. Right, senior scientist and uh, wildlife program manager. Oh, okay, Alberta. got the extra long title. I forgot yeah, about that. Awesome. <laughs> no, uh, glad to have you on. You've been on the podcast uh, a couple times before. If folks want to uh, source that out, um, but so the point the point of this show, the purpose is we kind of want to get an update on the wild turkey conservation work that's been. Uh, ongoing for quite a few years in Alberta uh, that has involved uh, translocation of turkeys from British Columbia, my part of the world, to uh, Alberta over last winter and this winter. So maybe start out there, Doug, um, give folks kind of a synopsis of that program and where that's got you to as of today. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. And I'll, maybe I'll start off, Mark, just saying, uh, well, thanks for having me on. <laughs> Absolutely. Love it. And, and I was going to say, I think we go to the same barber, which is very good. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah. But uh, I, so Alberta, we reached out to um, the public and landowners uh, two or three years ago and tried to get a better read on what's happened with the turkey population in the southwest part of the province. And we learned from many landowners that we reached out to that while turkeys were, they were much more common 20 years ago and even 40 years ago, but in many cases, um, all the way from sort of Longview in the north to Cardston in the south, um, pockets of turkeys have been winking out over the last like 15 years, certainly. And to the point where people who would have, maybe, maybe they grew up with, a family grew up with 20 or 30 turkeys around their ranch. Um, they may not have any turkeys anymore or just two or three. So we um, reached out to British Columbia a couple of years ago and asked if we would be able to translocate wild turkeys and move them into to Alberta. And we were given permission to do that. So we've been working in small communities, sort of all the way from your place down in Cranbrook up to Invermere and Radium. And, uh, and we've been given permission to take turkeys and they're really by definition um, problem turkeys in those those urban centers and capture them live capture them and then we disease test them um, which is just a precautionary thing that you would do anytime you're going to translocate pretty well anything across the border and uh, and then move them by in individual boxes in special turkey boxes <laughs> and move them over into British Columbia usually in groups of anywhere from 10 to 30 birds. We try and take, if we were able to capture a cohort of birds, say a group of 20 over a period of three or four days and get them disease tested, then we would try and translocate them and put them into the same location. So they stay as a group. And that's gone really well. It's a, you know, in the first year we were able to move and test and move 177 birds. Um, that was primarily from Invermere and Radium. And then yeah, this, this, this winter, up until early March, we moved to 183 birds uh, into locations in southwestern B or Alberta. And what we generally have been doing is putting those birds on a, in a ranch location where the landowner is feeding cattle over the winter. So that's one of the, the key considerations for us is we want to put them in a rural location and in a place where they'll have access to food over the cold months. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's, it's, 
it's a little controversial on the BC side because people are like, why don't you move the turkeys to like different areas in BC? BC's not um, big on wild turkeys because it's a non-native bird. Um, so there isn't like, you know, a lot of sort of support for actually managing them. Uh, and, and there's policies in place about moving birds around. It's kind of a no, no, that it's, it's not an indigenous bird. Uh, there's no management plan. Like, like you put in place in Alberta to cover off all the, uh, who, if, ands, or what's and contingency plans around uh, translocations. We, we don't have that. So, you know, and I've told a lot of folks here, it's like, so these, these were birds, which the towns were getting fed up with. So they weren't birds that were available for BC residents to hunt. They were living in towns and they had basically two options. Uh, they were going to get culled when nobody gets anything from them, no turkey meat, no nothing. Uh, they just get culled and, and tossed, or we could help augment this um, sort of problem that you identified at the start in Alberta with, with some numbers going down and sustainability of the flocks. And I'm, I've been a huge supporter of it. So. Well, yeah. And we really appreciate it that this is happening because for Alberta, really a translocation is really the only way in a sense, if you've got a population that's really started to get to low levels and pockets of very few birds, then they just become extremely disconnected. And in fact, we had that um, in one of the locations of just a real clear case where the landowner, before we dropped off birds last year, you know, they had five hens on their property, but there wasn't a male that showed up like that whole spring. And those, none of those hens were, they didn't breed that year. So like that is happening in locations in Alberta. And a lot of it is anecdotal information because it's difficult to tease this apart unless you have radio callers on birds to get very specific information. But we are pretty persistent about, you know, staying in contact with landowners to try and find out if they have hands that have brought poults back to their place. And, you know, and we have a, we have a public brood survey where the public, including all those landowners can provide information on whether they see um, poults um, in the summer and in the fall. So we have a decent understanding of what's going on with recruitment um, as well. So it's helping us to try and better understand the story. Oh, that's, that is so cool that, you know, that you do have people that are, that are helping and especially on working ranches. That's one of the issues we've had in Southern BC is the birds have got this bad rap because they're supposed to do all these horrible things when they get onto cattle ranch operations. And there's all these stories about, you know, ranchers are like, getting rid of them and you know the sss sort of thing or whatever and yeah. i don't i don't think it's a real thing it's you know like a street legend or whatever but um you know it, there's just such a different ethos um you know it's the same same business family farms family operations people's income but um you've really kind of had these private places take the birds under their under their wings to one count keep an eye on them um be around for for feeding they keep eyes on them if they see something maybe it's not right or one passes away or something you, you know you get notified and that's that's exciting i i love oh, love hearing that yeah. ranchers are want to be involved yeah and so that by far that's the that's the general response we get when we reach out to ranching families and ask if they'd like to be part of the program and host a turkey group or host a turkey relocation and so and that's really cool but I think part of part of that is also, and we're very upfront with them. I mean, we tell them these are birds that have been in these areas, and they've they've you know been say downtown in Vermeer, living next to the library. So, so they got they got a little leather jackets on with a patch on the back. So it's like gotta gotta well, watch your back. Well, they're not they're very familiar with people, and so that you know, so there could be some issues. But you know, there's some common sense when you get onto that ranch situation too, and if you you know, you have a blue healer running around the yard. They're not going to stay around the house if that blue healer is chasing him away. And, and so there's a way there's a way of dealing with them just like you would with other pests. Or I, I should, that's the wrong word to use. But if they're coming around your yard and causing problems, say on these ranching locations, then, you know, they would probably just chase them out of the yard. 
Yeah. But uh, yeah. the key thing is food, obviously. Yeah, no, for sure. So what what have you been seeing with the translocated birds? Have you, one, been able to kind of keep tabs on them once, you know, they've been released and what's happened to them over, you know, the winter? And are they filling in some of these gaps as far as finding the isolated hens breeding? Are we seeing clutches and... Yeah, it's, well, so there's, the story is, like, there's a number of layers to it. So, yeah, we've we've really tried, tried to strategically place them in pockets of 20 to 30 birds, um, like in multiple, like in, I say a dozen locations, all the way from south of Pincher Creek up to Longview. Um, and that's worked really well. And, and the reports back from landowners has been very positive. And for the most part, you know, the turkeys will stick around to that ranch site if they have ready access to feed. It doesn't work perfectly because they can decide to go on a wander, <laughs> you know, especially when you translocate an animal for whatever reason. Like in one location last year when we put them at one ranch site, you know, they didn't show up back at that ranch site until spring. Um, maybe I think it was even late spring, um, but they actually went to the next door neighbor's place. And uh, that person, we didn't actually put turkeys at that place, but they were feeding on a regular basis. And the turkeys just decided they liked that place a little bit more. <laughs> so that's where they went. But one of the issues that, that that's in play is that the birds that we're taking from these town sites, for the most part, are well heavily biased towards females. So this year we happened to take more males than last year, but it was only 8%. So of all the birds we took, there were only 8%, of, well, I should say 8% were mature toms. So 15 birds that were say two years old and older. Um, and last year it was even a lower percentage. So that means that, you know, we are trying to put these birds out in groups of 20 to 30, but it often means that there's only one, two or three mature toms that are available to breed the, the hands in that group. And so one of the challenges that we're recognizing um, is that, you know, not those toms aren't always around when it comes down to breeding season. Because it, as, um, as you, I know you're aware that turkeys, um, they, they don't necessarily, they, like when they actually hatch out is very likely going to be sometime between the 15th and maybe the 30th of June. We don't really know what those dates are because there have not been rigorous studies in Western Canada, to my knowledge, certainly. Um, but we're at that higher latitude right here. But that those dates would coincide with other galliforms that we have. And so, and I just mentioned that to say that this low proportion of males to the females that we've translocated means that we're in a very sort of vulnerable position with our in our breeding situation right now because there potentially aren't enough males around to breed all the females that are available yeah yeah that that is would would be a huge concern and i i'm to also understand like just like even in like healthy populations you get a, a female that has a clutch of 12 um there only there might only be one or two out of that 12 that are males they they're just um they're a, a group bird and the purpose is you know very heavily skewed to females and then geez i think it was dr mike chamberlain like years ago i, I read or saw him speaking about something that he, uh maybe on his um social media and he kind of followed the life of the male turkey to kind of show hunters what it actually takes to get a mature tom on the landscape uh, that's there for you to harvest and not impact the population. So he said, you're starting out with, you know, a, let's just say across a number of hands, a hundred um, poults are um, hatched. So 10 of them <laughs> are males. Yeah. And then he sort of talks about like the mortality rate of poults altogether then when they separate and the jakes go off in their little bunches, they they can't breed, but then they start to suffer a higher level of mortality because they're mm -hmm. three, four birds by themselves. 
um, you know, that, that are younger. And, and it was something along the lines that it took a hundred male birds to give you one mature long beard on the landscape, really? uh, at two, two years of age that was yeah. capable uh, of breeding. Like, like it was staggering. And then now you throw in hunter harvest on that and, you know, you can really understand why, um, you know, sort of the exuberance of longer seasons and higher bag limits in a few of the, of the, uh, Eastern and Southern states has, has contributed to their population decline. So it's, it's a very sensitive bird, even though they're kind of a big raptor dinosaur looking yeah. thing, they're very sensitive. Well, just the fact that they don't breed until at the earliest two years of age, that just puts it in a whole different context than our regular galliforms that are running around out there, like you know, our, all of our grouse species. Um, so it's, it's, it's not the same. And even the way, I mean, this is the only bird we're hunting. Well, I mean, the only galliform we're hunting in the spring um, when they're actually breeding. So it, it takes, there's a real nuance to it, which I think there's been a lot of assumptions about what the effect of taking males has been or how that affects the population. But it's really being questioned now by really wildlife scientists across North America, because you're trying to much more clearly understand how things like when you open your season, how that potentially negatively impacts breeding success. And it definitely can. It just, I mean, there's, there's a lot of logic in that. Um, yeah. And I was just thinking like here, like if we just throw up a date, like let's say we say the 15th of June as a hatch date would be probably on the earlier side. So you're going to get, it's not synchronous. There's going to be some birds that are going to hatch earlier than other birds. And that happens with all galliforms. And it especially can change if you have potentially say a real low proportion of, of males in a polygamous population like this. And let's say on the other side, you've got June 30th as being maybe at the other end. So let's, let, and I'm just spitballing here, but you have two weeks, um, which you can have a lot of hatching occur if they're successful with their first nest. And by that, I mean their first attempt at nesting. They don't nest twice and have two clutches, but they, if they lose, a, if let's say they lose some eggs when they've laid out five and those were to get predated upon, then they might go ahead and lay in the second in the second nest and try again, and that will delay nesting. But if you just take just a, a date in the middle, let's just say it's June twentieth is the date that that hen hatches out. That ver that basically means that she starts incubation around May twenty third, and she might have started laying. Let's just say she put ten or eleven eggs in the nest. You know, she started laying on the thirteenth. So. If you were to harvest that, if you were to take the males out of that um, area before May 23rd, and particularly by May 13th, but even up to May 23rd, you could negatively impact that that hen's ability to have put out a clutch that year. Yeah, so it's, it's yep. very tricky. Yeah, it is. And and when when I look at the the graphs um, of sort of you know the 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 ebb and flow of breeding seasons. There's, there's two components of it. It's, it's, uh, the birds come out of the winter flock and then the toms, um, start gobbling because testosterone builds up and like that's their, their, the you know, mating courtship. <laughs> so they actually, um, they actually get very quiet in peak breeding. So when the vast amount of breeding is going on, they're not actually doing a whole lot of gobbling because there's not a whole lot of reasons to, to woo hens. It's just getting to business. Um, so there's a period in there where there's peak breeding. It's relatively quiet as I understood it. And then it's kind of like not every hen's bred um, over, you know, a period of time, but it's like most of them are like, 80% or something like that, then those hens start going off on a daily basis, um, uh, laying eggs. And then when they reach, then they start, they, they reach their clutch maximum, they start to incubate and they got to sit on that nest for 25 to 29 days or something, 26 to 29 days, or, you know, something like that. And then more and more each day, each, you know, each week, more and more and more are starting to incubate, but like there can that this can go on like well into the spring, but it's kind of like 
the biologists want to know is like, when is most of the breeding happened and when is most of the hens starting to incubate? Um, not all of them, but your population is going to run on when the vast majority of this happens. And the sensitivity seems to come if you don't know where that peak breeding thing is uh, and you're in there killing the long beards, which are the only ones capable of breeding, then hunting disrupts breeding. They know that. Um, but then it also, you know, disrupts it, the, the efficiency part, but then the actual like hens aren't getting fertilized. So right. it's, yeah. Yeah. It's, it's how, yeah, it's how, how well do you think we understand, like you said, we, we don't really understand too much in, in Western Canada of, you know, when this ebb and flow is of peak breeding, peak incubation. Yeah, I think we've got a pretty good understanding of some other species. And, you know, the, the research work I've done, say, on sharp-tailed grouse at the same latitude, but just further to the east. Now, those birds are at a lower elevation, although not a lot. Like, there's some that would be almost the same elevation as the as the turkeys that are in the area. I'm actually in the area where turkeys occur in southwestern Alberta. But, uh, you know, say a sharp tail... Most of those sharp tails, if they if they're successful with their first nest attempt, they will hatch out between the 10th and the 20th of June. Okay. But it's very common to have, um, like, say, in a, a sharp tail that does lose, you know, it, say a sharp tail lays 12 to 14 eggs on average, and they might lose their first nest, say, on day 10 of laying then very, it's very common for them to make a second nest attempt, but they don't start it the next day. Like often there's a delay of, you know, five, six, seven days, even more, because that hen is going to go find a new location. They're never going to put a, you know, they're never going to try and lay in the same nest. So there's disruption that happens there. And then they're going to go back and be bred. And there's always activity after the peak, peak lecking period. Now I'm talking about sharp tails, but I think there's, there's some, comparisons with other galliforms it's not that strange when a, if a hen turkey was to have lost a nest she's not gonna she's not gonna go and start laying in a second nest the next day there's gonna be a delay and that's why we do have turkeys that end up having clutches in July right like right through to the end of July so what we've done this year is we've put um, collars on we don't have a, a lot of collars on. We're actually testing some satellite collars right now. And we've put them on seven birds, seven hens that were translocated this winter. And we're going to try and we're going to try and figure out number one, what how well the collars work, because we'd like to initiate um, a more ambitious collaring program in the coming years so that we can get a better understanding of the nesting ecology of turkeys in Western Canada, certainly here in Alberta. And there's some key things. I mean, we obviously want to figure out survivorship, but we want to find out um, when hens are um, first laying, when they're incubating, and also what the reproductive success is over time. And so one of the things that we're doing, I, you know, we're doing that, um, we asked the public to report back on uh, the number of pulse per hen that they're finding. But those numbers so far that we're getting back are relatively low. And I, you know, and I jotted them down here so I could let you know what those are. But at the general target for um, turkeys would be two to two poults per hen um, going into late summer or into early fall. That's the target if you take the average of hens in your area. Um, and of course, some of them have none and some of them might have three or four. But we're finding, though, um, the average so far for for the last three years has been below two to one, you know, in Alberta. The first year it was just a little above 1.5. In 2022, it was below one to one. It was like 0.97 to one. And then this past year in 2023, it was 1.39 to one. And what that suggests to us is that, well, number one, recruitment is quite low. But it also speaks most most likely to this problem that I already mentioned, that there's a good chance that we've got many hands in southwestern Alberta that just aren't being bred. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Um, 
yeah, and coupled with the fact of, you know, we don't really have a handle on sources of mortality, um, like we know from the literature. But um, one of the really challenging things, I think, for Western Canada in the turkey science is we're ecologically, we're kind of different, right? Um, you know, maybe not that far off of maybe Montana, Idaho, uh, Washington or whatever, but we've got quite an assemblage of predators, um, four-legged as well as avian. Uh, We don't have the snakes like they do in the South. Uh, You know, that's that's an issue. But yeah, you know, that's, and it doesn't even have to be predation as well. It can be just, you know, um, anything from infertile eggs to um, weather to the timing of, food and and the insects being available you know when the poults come out and stuff like that that uh yeah it's hard to say where where birds are going (laughs) yeah and if if you have so there's a few few things that can really compound that i think at these north northern latitudes if we have a really hard winter like we you know the last one we had was say 2018 and you have a lot of birds that go through that winter and lose body mass all the way through it you could have a spring where, frankly, they can't afford to um, go into that breeding season planning on nesting like they would in a normal season. And we saw that with, and I mentioned this to you, you know, before when we talked about partridge, but that is what happened with partridge out at the demonstration farm at Enchant in the spring of 2018, is we just had many females that year that just didn't breed. They'd gone through an extremely hard winter and uh, they, we lost, roughly speaking, 75 to 80 percent of our population out of the farm that year. And I would imagine with turkeys, it wouldn't be dissimilar because we know that in those harsh winter periods and 2018 being an example, that we lost quite a few turkeys that were literally dying, you know, and they were falling out of roost trees, you know, that winter and wow. dying and, and the landowners would find them on the ground. So, you know, there can be those punctuated winter events that really mess things up. But the other thing that, that I think is worth considering, you know, as, as we try and understand this, that, that birds that say hatch out at later dates, just in general with ground nesting birds, those that hatch out, say, a month later than the average hatch date um, tend to do have much poorer survivorship. And that could be for a variety of reasons, but just on a very coarse level, they're not going to go into that fall having gained the body mass, potentially the the feather growth that, that you'd normally want them to have. And they will be more susceptible to almost anything coming down the pike, um, including, you know, whether it's just simply parasite loads, that sort of thing. So there's, there's vulnerabilities when you look at rec- the way that breeding happens and just having delayed hatch dates and all the rest of it. And that can lead to problems as you go into winter as well. Yeah. Yeah. Now you, you were saying you've got GPS um, tags on, is it just hens? It's just hens. Okay. So I'm curious there, like, why did you not put them on the toms to see like, Oh, Hey, look, toms are, you know, they're traveling from here and they're going like 30 kilometers over there and 20 kilometers over there, like, or they're not. Um, cause it, that would almost sort of seem like that would answer that, that breeding, non-breeding question. Yeah. So the, so if, so we only have seven, um, satellite callers out this year and it's to test them. So we're trying different brands basically. Oh, okay. And okay. Gotcha. So the, the idea would be to have enough, um, callers out there so you can answer say a particular ecological question or several ecological questions and when you split them apart like that because if you're trying to answer reproductive success um, questions then in the end you're really trying to figure out whether the hens are being bred or not and and when they start laying and you try and pattern that out and I think when they're incubating at least with a satellite caller that should be fairly easy to tell but the but putting them on the mail, you really won't know how many hands he's covered. Like that would be yeah, really hard. Gotcha. Yeah. 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 No, it makes, <laughs> makes sense. Okay. I just, I mean, it se- seemed like a, a lay person's kind of a question. 
if money was no object, you'd, 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 know, oh, you'd yeah. maybe go after that other question because you would want to understand as well, you know, what your movement is. And, and if you had, so if you had 20 individuals that were, say, working one valley and you could put, you know, multiple colors in, you could, say, put colors on two or three males there as well as eight or nine females, that would be the ideal situation. Yeah. Yeah. I know in some of the studies they've done in the States, talking like money, money's a, a, as an object sort of thing, they put the GPS tags on the hunters too. And I've seen these, oh, yeah. these data sets of like the green dots are the toms and the red dots are the hunters. And it's like, you watch this dance, <laughs> you know, <laughs> of like, well, the hunter sat at this spot for from 920 AM to 1020 AM and then called and then got up and left and then at 1120 the tom that was over there showed up right where the, where the guy was calling uh but there's some interesting you know things that they have found there um and where i'm going with this is what i understand is that hunters in the turkey woods during the breeding season are having an impact not even from the sense of like killing um the males their presence is disrupting things. They're pushing birds farther away. The they birds know. So now you're starting to like force groups of birds away from each other, uh, which is going to affect breeding success. Uh, I'm to also understand that the hunter presence when the hunting season opens, gobbling activity will decline and incubation will decline. So you get out there and they're going around and they're pressing birds and they're shooting and, you know, whatever. It's like, I've seen some of the charts where it's like, you know, gobble activity does this hunting season opens and then it's boom, you know, and then, and then a little kind of like pick up again. So, so there's that, I don't know what you would call that. There's like this, this disruption thing that's sort of on top of killing um, males, uh, breed, breeding males, um, that has the potential to result in reduced production. Right. And didn't, when you were talking with Mike, uh, Chamberlain, didn't you guys talk about the fact that when you do take out a dominant male, that it also has an impact? Uh, because yeah, so they have their, they have their hierarchy established, um, and there it's the pecking order. So if you take the top dude out of a group of five they actually kind of have to um reposition themselves a little bit have some arm wrestling competitions uh and then the next uh one you know whoever wins uh assumes you know the, the breeding rights in the area it's not necessarily a um you know uh, second in command just moves up the ladder it's like it's not like the military they have to go through that exercise again part of that is compounded by the fact that that dominant bird um, can actually exert his presence, can exert an impact on the testosterone production of the subordinate birds um, to the fact that they can't actually breed. If they were saying, Hey, you got the call, buddy, you're coming up yeah. to the big leagues going, it doesn't work. You know, the big say, guy scared me, me too bad. <laughs> yeah. Give me a minute. <laughs> um and then, of course, like the young Jakes, like a year younger, or whatever, um, they just can't breed. Their testes are are too small. So, if they're all that's left is you know two or three um, Jakes, like this is not yeah. going to happen that year for for the hens in that in that geographic area. Yeah, well, it's yeah, it's it's boy, it's complex, isn't it, compared to some of our other birds? <laughs> it, it is, and you know, and. So the logical question is, is sort of like, well, why don't you just have your hunting season for them in the fall and just like, like don't, don't compromise, um, the sustainable populations, uh, and take your birds off, you know, uh, the, the top end before going into winter where you have mortality. And I guess the challenge there is, um, is it's fun. <laughs> you know, the spring it's, it's like you're calling, they're coming in. There's, there's all that excitement, which is not there in, in the fall, right? Like the, 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 the pleasure of the hunt, uh, isn't there, uh, as, as much. And that's part of the experience is probably the biggest experience in turkey hunting. So mm -hmm. turkey management is this balance between biology and, and 
hunter satisfaction and hunter success. So, yeah. And it's, it, it is a challenge because you know, it, there probably is a number, like there's probably a way of doing it where your level of, of male harvest of mature toms doesn't negatively impact that population. Uh, but you'd have to have quite a large portion or a higher portion of males maybe than we're seeing occurring across much of North America. Like, and, and there is, there seems to be, and I think maybe BC is an example of this, where there's a bit of a lag. I mean, you've had turkeys for many years now, but it's only been in the more, what I would guess the more recent years, like maybe the last 10 years when interest in turkey hunting has really increased. Yes. Yeah. Yep. So in that sense, um, you know, what impact is hunting going to have on a turkey population when there's only 200 people doing it and you have, you know, many thousands of birds, let's say, um, maybe it's not going to be very much, but as those 100 numbers increase and maybe harvest goes up, then you can definitely have an impact. And in Alberta, you know, our situation, we have a much lower population, you know, we're estimating right now, and this again is, is it reports we're getting back from landowners. And so that's information that, you know, to the best of our knowledge, we try and contact certainly every landowner we've contacted in the past to see whether or not they have turkeys. But, and then we ask them if they know anyone else in their zone that has turkeys. And, you know, we've had, what we've noticed over the last um, several years is that turkey numbers have, like really when we started doing this in 2021, you know, we, we re heard that we had, say, roughly speaking, 840 turkeys over five zones, sort of in that geographic area that I mentioned before. But it went down the, you know, in 2022, and it even went down in 2023 when you don't count the birds that we translocated that year. So it, it was down around 600 and say 40 birds or so in 2023 without counting the birds we brought in from British Columbia. And then in this, in this winter, you know, the count is a little bit higher than that. It's up to about 660 birds. And that's counting the birds that we brought in from British Columbia the previous year, but not the ones that we translocated this winter. But when we talk to landowners and from our recruitment information, those brood surveys, we know that a lot of that wasn't from recruitment. That was from, you know, some, some carryover from the birds from the previous year, the translocation. And so it suggests to us, and I don't really know what the mortality is naturally of turkeys. We don't have that data because we simply haven't researched that with, you know, robust methods in the, certainly not in Alberta at this stage, but you're going to expect that you're going to have, fair, you know, you're going to have some natural mortality with just with your wild turkey population in general. Um, and then whenever you move a translocated bird, it's common, even though we didn't notice this, you know, at you know, over the first few months, but you're probably going to have over that first year, maybe a little higher mortality than you would if they were to stay in a place where they were um, normally living, let's say. But of those, in those areas or in, in the five zones that, that we have turkeys, you know, we have one of those zones where we can't even hunt them at this point in time. So it's, it's that area doesn't, that's included in our population estimate, but it's a non-huntable zone. So we don't have a lot of birds in the Is that just because there's they're just not doing well in that that zone or like too too few? I think it's I, actually I wouldn't I'd say that zone is probably about the same as the others, you know, okay. in terms of how it appears to be doing, but it's just that's the northern part. That's the long view area. There's no hunting season there right now. Um, but if you take those birds out of it, you know, our population that's available to hunt is less than 500 birds that we're aware of. So okay. it's a, okay. yeah, it's, so it's a, you know, it's one of those things where it's a, yeah, there's, we don't know how accurate those numbers are, like, you know, just to be really clear, but it is our best estimate. Um, and so, you know, it's, it could be off by a certain percentage, but when you add up all the, the information that we've been able to gather by gather, gathering this information from landowners about, these are winter roost counts that they're doing. Um, and then you add up our brood survey, survey information, which suggests that recruitment is below two to one. You know, we still have a ways to go before we're going to turn the turkey population around in, in Alberta. Yeah, yeah. 
And another thing I learned from Dr. Chamberlain, um, and this is, you know, uh, like fairly consistent across North America, but he said like 80% of the toms that are killed in the entire hunting season is in the first week of the season. And so it, it's kind of like, that's, that's pretty shocking. Cause sometimes it's taken me till like the end of the season. to get my, what do you mean the first week? <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, I find birds and I have fun or whatever, but I, I get a lot of the birds giving me the bird, um, yeah. you know, and, yeah. and so it's fun, but funny. you know, I think part of what that really drove home to me was how fundamentally critical it is to the sustainability of the populations that are being hunted in really having an understanding of peak breeding and, and peak incubation, because it's really down to the wire of five days could, could oh, yeah. make or break a population for like an entire year or, or more if, if you timed it wrong. Right. Cause it's like, if you're like, Oh, you know, this is a, this is a pretty good opening date. Wham. Hunters have got 80% of your birds killed. And then you're like, Holy smokes, you know? Yeah. And, and then the other thing I've seen in the science is like in places, you know, like South Carolina, I was looking at their data a little while ago and it's like, they got it really dialed in and they know the different peaks and the dates and stuff. But then they show you that same data set over the last 20 years and all of those peaks are shifting back and forth from year to year by yeah. five to seven days. The breeding right. earlier, the breeding later, the peak is earlier, the peak is later. So it's almost like they've put confidence intervals and then set their hunting season. So they're not guessing every year, like a week before the season opens saying, yeah, it's going to open or sorry, fellows, it's going to be like two more weeks or whatever. Um, but Gosh, here in BC, like I feel really uncomfortable with not knowing and having learned how sensitive, um, you know, that, that opening date is. And of course ours opens on the 15th and, and, yeah. uh, I'm, you know, I'm concerned about that because primarily from the experience, uh, of having a tremendous amount of hand up toms, which is supposed to be one of the indicators of like, you're still kind of in the middle of it, you know? Um, so well, yeah, I don't know. What really are your thoughts speak. around that? Yeah. Well, I mean, I, so, so this is anecdotal information, but you know, where, where we live, we have over the last say 15 years had turkeys at our place, especially over the first 10 years, they were very common and it would be certainly between the 30th of March and about the 15th of April, we'd have, you know, anywhere from 10 to, you know, 15 or even 20 birds that would hang out. They would come to our place, you know, several times a week during this time. And there would even be copulations at that time, or at least a male trying to cover a female. But that doesn't mean that that's, that that hen's going to run off and go lay an egg then. That's not what's happening at that time of year. I mean, that's, that's males and females being males and females <laughs> yeah, at that time. And so I think there is a lot of activity and, and, and the ma males will strut their stuff and they'll be around there and they're with a big group of hens often at that time. But when I've noticed them when they're actually, what I think is when they're actually um, laying or at least being probably going to males probably to be fertilized and sort of in, in May, you know, it's often not in groups of females like that. At least that's not what I'm observing. It's more like you've got several, you know, two or three or one female, you know, that's going out to, to maybe visit a Tom. And I, that is just anecdotal. Cause I said, I haven't had callers on these birds, so I don't mm. have a good enough understanding of what's happening, but I do think it's easy to misinterpret what might be considered breeding activity when people see that happening, what they perceive it to be happening in maybe late March or early April you know, at our latitude. That's, that just isn't, I think, I think that's very unlikely to be the case that that turkey is going to then go off and start laying in mid-April and, uh, and then have a clutch on the ground in May. Like yeah. I just, honestly, I've yeah. never heard that. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, and the, and the whole part of latitude uh, is the the amount of daylight is different with the higher 
latitudes, which is the triggers, which is timed so that, you know, offspring and weather and temperature and availability and food is kind of all, everything all sort of lines up, uh, you know, nature's pretty, pretty cool that way. So for us in Canada, Southern BC, uh, Southern Alberta, Southern Manitoba and stuff, we're at higher latitudes than even our neighbors in Washington, Idaho, and Montana. So we can look to them for guidance, but it's very possible that just that little higher of latitude shifts things by two weeks, um, yeah. you know, here. And, and if we're picking their start dates for hunting season, it might work for them biologically where, like you said, it's like, you know, we might be too early or, or you know, or, or something picking that. And, and it probably has a lot to do. Like, again, you can, you can afford to have a margin of error a little more comfortably if you have, you know, 25 or 50,000 birds in your jurisdiction, where if you make an error, it's not necessarily the end of the world, depending on how many birds you're, you're harvesting. But if you've just got several thousand or less than a thousand, it really makes a big difference. Yeah. You know, you're, you're, you're literally... <laughs> I've looked at some of the numbers from the States and it's like, oh, this state harvested 40,000 turkeys in the yeah. season or, or Kentucky, they took 17,000 turkeys in the youth season in the first five days or whatever. Right. Like yeah. I'm just going like, holy smokes. Yeah. And that's, I mean, that's really is cool that they have that sort of productivity, but we, you, you know, I know, well, I don't know. I, I, I think what Mike Chamberlain's group is doing right now and, and people in different jurisdictions is they're really trying to nail down these dates in the spring and get a better understanding of that. And so there's, there's quite a few jurisdictions that are really trying to drill down on that now to try yeah. and understand it. So it is an issue for, um, for breeding success is figuring out when your hunting season dates should begin relative to when your um, incubation dates are. And, you know, in Canada at this point in time, at least in Western Canada, um, you know, we really haven't got that sorted out. Yeah. And, and I mean, you know, I can, you know, the hunters, you know, the spring comes along and everybody's itching to get out there. I can't wait, you know, two more weeks and they <clears throat> want to, yeah. you know, get out there and have the earlier opening dates, which is, you know, uh, fair enough. But, you know, when you look at what happens in turkey populations in the springtime, that the peak of gobbling activity, when the gobblers are actually high testosterone levels and they're losing their minds, <laughs> is when there's a period where most of the hens are incubating. So the incubation itself, so they're quiet, like I said, they're quiet during the breeding then as more and more and more hens starting to incubate because they're good for the springtime, that process of incubating gets the toms excited. So the hens are wanting less, less hens are having wanting less to do with toms, but the toms are getting more excited. So you actually get these two curves that cross each other, pink incubation, and then the toms start losing their minds and they're traveling all over the landscape looking for these the a smaller and smaller percentage of hens that still need some, yeah. some servicing. And what a great time to be out there hunting when the toms aren't hand up, but they got yeah. peak testosterone levels and they're losing their minds. It's like gobble, gobble, gobble. And they're like, it's a foot race to, you know, get to, you know, to the hunter because they've, you know, heard, heard the hen call or something like that. So, you know, I don't thing personally from an, a spring experience hunting turkeys if if it was later like you know the latter half of may or something like that we can still have some amazing hunting oh. because of peak gobbling and that's when dr chamberlain said is like after all those peaks are over it's kind of like the dominant toms are kind of expendable right the that jakes are next year's breeders. So if you're killing Jake's in a bearded only season, you can have an impact. But if you are selective um, in, you know, a May season or something like that, it's like, yep, they're expendable long beards. And wouldn't that make sense too, when you think about, um, you know, the, just the weather we can get in May 
And sometimes you can get an early May where it's it's reasonably nice. But I know in the where I am, um, it's very common to have snow in the trees, you know, into early May. And so yep. you really don't burn that off often until um, the middle to the end of May. So yeah. that, frankly, is probably just a better time to be out anyway. And it's almost certainly going to have a lower impact. I think we really need to dial in on these these incubation dates and try and sort that out and then just see where that falls. But it's it's very likely going to be sometime in that last two weeks, I would guess. Yeah. yeah. When incubation date starts. Yeah. On uh, two weeks of May. May. Yeah. 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 Sometime yeah. that it'll, I'm guessing, I don't think it'll be the 15th. Well, I mean, my guess is that it's going to be sometime, you know, maybe between the 20th and the 30th of May when incubation starts. Yeah. Peak, peak incubation. Yeah. 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 Interesting. Interesting. Now, now one of the differences between BC and Alberta um, is we have a general open season in BC, mm -hmm. more, more birds, um, but you have the permit system uh, in Alberta. Is that like, I've never actually looked at the data. Like, is there like a lot of, tags that are given out through the lottery or are they very tight and like because i'm to understand like it's almost like a once in a lifetime type draw in alberta for the for the turkeys so yeah it, it is the yeah. harvest seems to be really tightly controlled but it's also relative to how sustainable or how robust your populations are so yeah so it is very difficult to get a turkey tag in alberta i believe um, that it it may be our most highest um, subscribed um, draw. So more people, I believe, put in for turkeys than any other species, I believe, on an annual wow. basis. Wow. Um, and I and I don't know what the how the stats would play out right now, but certainly if you started trying to draw a turkey today, my guess is that that you would wait. You know, you wouldn't do it before. You know, it'd be, it'd be many, many years, not not 10 years, probably not even 10, not 20 years if you started today. You, you know, it'd be much longer than that based on the number of tags that are given out on an annual basis. So it is, yeah, like you say, it's a once in a lifetime opportunity right now in Alberta, given where our population's at and given the number of tags that are available. Yeah, yeah. So what are, you know, it, it just seems like, there's lots of questions with turkey management and the populations, you know, in, in Alberta, uh, trying to sustain, <clears throat> you know, uh, hunting opportunity on them is, is, you know, part of the underlying philosophy of all, you know, the work <clears throat> that's being done. So where, where are your priorities in, in ACA over the next few years of supporting like decisions about seasons and tag allocation and that sort of thing uh, that's obviously made in government, not, not by your agency. What, yeah, so, what so are you ACA, doing to support that? Yeah. So yeah, clearly ACA is not involved in um, setting season dates or tag allocations or those sorts of things. We, we would provide information that would try and, um, help make those decisions by government biologists. Uh, but at this point in time, you know, as I said, our, our information that we're gathering the best information that we have the ability to do so at this time. But if we want to take it and gain more resolution um, with the, say the turkey population, which we have, which is fairly low, then we really need to up the game and, you know, do something like put transmitters on birds because that's how you're going to gain your resolution on if you're trying to if you're be, if you're trying to change a season date or gain the information to understand what impact hunting let's say might have on a season date and you want to understand when incubation starts you really have to drill down on that with the use of say um, callers of some sort mm. and and put those on hands and to better understand that and it's not fast nothing like that is fast and you know as as um, anyone who's studied, you know, any grouse like birds, whether it's, you know, grouse, quail or turkeys, you know, you cannot even rely necessarily on the information you get from one season because you can have anomalies that happen in a season 
and you need to have a sample size which is reasonable and one thing with uh, say turkeys or or pheasants or grouse is you have to, if you're going to try and figure that out for say females in an area you can't just put it on 10 birds you are going to have to put it on enough birds so that you can measure recruitment say the number of chicks per hen coming out you know that are happening in september and that often means um, putting transmitters on say 60 to 80 birds starting in that season and you probably have to do it for at least three three years to try and get um, three data points or say averages per year as and that's kind of just a starting point for getting the kind of resolution that you that you want to have to make informed decisions yeah yeah, yeah. no it's it's uh it's <clears throat> it's pretty intense um you know in, in all wildlife management but that's you know why hunters stand behind science-based wildlife management and in order to have that um we got to have the <clears throat> you know the money behind um behind that so you you can get the data to support you know the decisions uh it's it's a really important connection between <clears throat> between all of those things one of the things i would be really interested in in alberta um one of the biggest differences i see is habitat mm. so the the miriam's wild turkey was originally um the turkey of the of the southern rocky mountains it was the rocky mountain turkey so when they started to expand their translocations you know in the in the 30s 40s and 50s it's like well you just follow the rocky mountains all the way up and there's all this similar ponderosa pine douglas fir habitat uh as the southwest and plunk the turkeys in it's like yep they and they did that with you know the easterns and and everywhere else and there's some rios in the spokane valley because it's similar you know to some places in texas and and whatnot but turkeys don't like thick hmm. and so quail and rough grouse and stuff and pheasants like that thick understory uh turkeys don't they don't like to fight through it they don't like push through it and in a lot of the southern pine plantations they do a lot of burning um and that can actually enhance turkeys and affect quail <laughs> mm -hmm. um so so there's there's a a balance there that managers make in the south but in in the kootenai area here in bc it's like we got a lot of douglas fir forest we got a lot of ponderosa pine forest we have the mosaics of open forests and grasses and forbs and where in the foothills of alberta it my limited experience is you've got like the open prairie lands and then it's like your forested areas and your parkland areas are quite densely wooded, densely stocked. Um, it doesn't seem like you've got a lot of that, like, you know, the big old trees and you're walking through it and it's kind of like the big, the big parkland type thing. It's like you immediately get into like rose thickets and snowberry thickets and, and fairly thick ish type forests. And so I would be really interested in seeing habitat selection from your yeah. hands and, and start to look at that habitat piece going, you know, they're traveling a large landscape, but they really just like this one little patch. Uh, and then that could in the future be data that starts to kick in a habitat enhancement project. And as we all know, burning's going to yeah. mule deer like it, white tails like it, elk like it and turkeys like it. So. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I don't think I know enough about that to really to even comment. Yeah. Um, Mark, it, it, it's there. Are, yeah. So I would say there's certainly areas maybe closer to Cranbrook and you have a lower, it's, it's a different soil type. You certainly have a sandier soil than we have. So you, in this area that, that I'm in and probably going up highway 22 between Longview and all the way down south of Pincher, that's definitely a, a different system. But it's, yeah, it's, I don't think of it as being thick, like it's, but then you have areas like the flathead and for you, like that's, that's thick. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. that's all, you know, it's all burnt out now, but <laughs> yeah. But you don't have turkeys down there either. I don't, I don't no, think to you. No, no, yeah. no. So yeah. Yeah, it would just, it's just an, in, you know, an interesting sort of, you know, I think of like, 
Miriam's turkey, the classic habitat is the old growth, Douglas fir ponderosa pines that have been frequently burned, not a lot of thick understory. A ponderosa pine is incredibly important to the Miriam's turkey because of the mm. seeds. Uh, they tend to concentrate in the East Kootenai area into the ponderosa pine ecosystem. So you winter in areas with with high ponderosa pine and unfortunately there's no ponderosa pine on the east side of the of the southern rockies so yeah i think the the habitat food piece would be if if i were to plunk in and be a turkey scientist in alberta uh, that would be something that would really interest me yeah i think i think there'd be lots of questions like this like you're dialing in on which would be really interesting to do and uh, I think you could layer it in if there was interest and support to do that, then you try and figure out the breeding ecology and your male to female ratio and age structure in your population. And you'd really want to dial into habitat selection and how even those other things like breeding success might be influenced by the habitat that's available and yeah. the resources. I mean, it, yeah. it's obviously we all know that it, it's all ties together and it's all fundamentally important for any group of birds. So it's kind of a, a wrap up uh, question. I know you and I talked about this last year. I don't know if this is still kind of like, you know, like a question in the community in Alberta, but I'm sure it's in the thoughts of, you know, in the minds of, of people that are listening and, you know, in Alberta, you have a, pheasant release program and folks are raising them and you know and releasing them so the logical sort of thing is is like wouldn't it be a heck of a lot easier to like pen raise wild turkey somewhere like have a contract with some operations that could grow like thousands in a season and then move those out rather than just like a hundred at a time coming from a community in in bc um do you mean like I know there's some history behind that in North America of uh, that you might want to fill folks in on, but it, it just seems like a logical question, right? Like if you're reintroducing them, why don't we just oh, grow them? Oh, grow them. So generally, farm so them. Mean, yeah. So <laughs> yeah, like, in in general, though, taking pen reared birds and trying to augment a population so that it will grow into a sustainable and growing population on its own, become naturalized is actually um, has not been successful, like largely unsuccessful, both with turkeys and with pheasants. Okay. So, okay. Like if, if you look at the, like say turkeys as an example, that was tried. So everyone thinks they can engineer a solution. No offense. <laughs> no offense to the engineers. I'm not an engineer. <laughs> but you can't, but like with wild, with, with birds, it's really tricky and, it, and it's becoming more complex you know, even this century compared to a hundred years ago, but that was tried right across North America with turkeys, like a lot, you know, pen rearing birds and releasing them and trying to grow them. And it wasn't until um, jurisdictions switched to translocating wild turkeys into other locations, into other jurisdictions and trying to do it that way, that really a lot of these states south of us took off with their turkey populations. And that's how, honestly, how Alberta worked. Um, it's not like people haven't tried to release turkeys, I'm sure. In fact, I've heard of that happening in Alberta where people have tried to take, you know, pen reared birds and do it. But in general, that doesn't work very well. And it doesn't work with pheasants. Like, I, he I hear that and I probably, I will get numerous calls and emails a year asking about this, the same question on pheasants. And it is remarkably unsuccessful with pheasants. There's so many things that have to go right because you're taking a bird which hasn't been reared in the wild and you're trying to turn it into something that has the instincts of a wild bird before it gets killed. And it and it just it's it's not just a number number scheme, but you have to do it with a lot of birds to even have a hope of having a very small proportion survive. And we're with pheasants in very, very good habitat, you're talking about, you know, trying to get 5% of your hens to survive if you release a hundred of them in the absolute best places. Wow. So, yeah. It's a, yeah, it's, yeah, it's very tricky. The, the one book, I think we both have it there, the, the big thick uh, turkey management book, 
uh, I think it, it talks about it in there, like that, the history of, you know, the failure of pen raised birds in the United States. And, and the one I remember is, is like the wild gene kind of thing, right? In, in the birds and what it takes to be a successful bird in a pen is the opposite hmm. genetic traits being expressed than what it takes to be a bird that can survive in the wild. If you were a chick that's or a poult that's born in captivity and you are like the wild raging bird that's going to go on to, you know, breed and proliferate, you are going to be like thrashing and beating and kicking and tearing up everything in a pan. And the, the rancher's going to be like, that thing is like hurting and damaging and injuring all the other birds. It's like, it's got to go. It's a nutcase bird. And so they would pluck those ones out and they, they, they pluck out uh, the ones that should actually be the ones that go into the wild. So you end up with the tame genes and you turn them loose and they're like, Oh, look, there's a hawk up in the sky. Isn't it very pretty? You know, and bam, you know, it's like by next yeah. Sunday, they're all dead kind of thing. And, and I just remember that that's sort of like the, the wildness genes it's bred out of them in captivity and that's what we need in the wild. And I think some of those programs in the U S like they were talking like 0% survival success after release. It's like every yeah. single bird was dying and getting eaten up. So. Yeah. And, and it's never perfect even with translocations because of the, what I mentioned before about them just being more vulnerable when they get to a new location, but it's been demonstrated time and again, that that is the most successful approach mm -hmm. for reestablishing birds you know, and actually having a population that'll have a chance of taking off over time. But one of the key things is doing it year after year after year. You can't stop after just one or two years. You have to okay. keep going. That makes, that makes good sense. Yeah. Yeah. So um, lots of towns in Southern British Columbia that uh, municipalities don't like like their turkeys, right? So we don't quite have the problems like you see in Montreal where it's chasing people around in subdivisions and in people's town. lives are being feared or whatever, but uh, it's not yeah. quite happening here yet. But uh, lots of towns, uh, especially as you go a little bit farther west of, of Cranbrook, you know, a little more, a little longer distance to transport, but um, lots of problem birds there. Any final kind of wrap up thoughts, messages that you want to communicate about uh, the program in Al Alberta? Yeah. So I think that, I think the program is, is on the right track. And I think we've got a lot to be, lot to be optimistic about in terms of turning around the population. Um, right now, you know, when we have enough males, I think we're going to see recruitment over time and that could that will build up the population, but we have to be thinking about it in terms of, you know, at least four or five years to start seeing positive results, not to anticipate that they would just happen overnight. And I think right now, you know, we just finished, you know, translocating birds and I'm hoping we're going to get some recruitment this spring. Um, Cause it's looking like it's going to be a real good spring. It's a, you know, it was an easy winter. I think on both sides of the border, you know, yep. BC, just that one cold snap there. For a for, uh, uh, little longer than normal, just in the new year, minus 35, 37-ish kind of yeah. temperatures. <laughs> yeah. But but yeah. I, the snow the snow depth was lower, which I think is the key thing for wild animals. Snowpack has been low, yeah. So that's that. they should have been able to at least find food over wintertime without too much difficulty, hopefully. Yeah. Awesome. So, yeah, kind of main messages. Um, it, you started a program, you need to be kind of in it for the long game to see the measurable successes for Albertans um, and to support and expand science, um, getting GPS on birds so that you guys have a better understanding of what they're doing, what the um, production rates are like when peak breeding, when peak um, incubation is um, to help support management decisions so that Albertans may, you know, my dream is that one day I would love to see Alberta have an open season like we do. Like, oh, cause there's great. people that are never going to get experienced turkey hunting. Uh, if the status quo, like I really want to see 
things grow and take, take off in Alberta so that you can be like, Hey man, like <laughs> it's good times folks. Uh, you know, we've got yeah. some op- open zones for you because you know, our turkeys are doing so good because 10 years ago, 15 years ago, we invested all of this and we stuck with it. Mm-hmm. I, th- I think is what my, my dreams would be for you guys. Yeah. And, and mine as well. I mean, I, I think we are talking about something that is possible within 10 to 15 years. Um, if, if, you know, decisions are made now to try and turn it around so that we have that opportunity. No, it's a, it's, it's not, it's not going to happen overnight, but it's, it's, it's possible. So great. Great. Well, um, I'm, I'm envious because you're doing all the things that we're not uh, in BC. Like I said, we have kind of a, a, a poor attitude towards them uh, when it comes to, to, to management. We don't have, we're not investing uh, the money. We don't see them as a priority, even though there's a tremendous um, demand uh, for hunting them here. And even like folks from Alberta can come to BC uh, and hunt them on, on a D, DYI hunt. Uh, it's like... Right the opportunity is great here for both our provinces, uh, but the will to take stewardship and managing them sustainably to the next level so that both um, provinces can sort of uh, benefit from that is just, just not here. So I just, I love, I love what you're doing and man, I'd do anything to support, you know, your, your program and, and what you're doing and wish the best for hunters in Alberta. Well, thanks very much, Mark. And we're excited about it. And thanks for having me on again. Appreciate it. Thank you. Really appreciate it. Uh, Very informational. And and folks, keep keep tabs on the Alberta Conservation Association uh, and their program, what they're doing. They have amazing communication. And even though I don't live in Alberta, I get their magazine subscription because uh, I'm just interested in conservation and hunting all over Canada. And so if you're in BC and or Saskatchewan or anywhere and you're interested in what's happening with the program here, um, get a subscription to the magazine and, and, you know, get updates and, and um, articles and stuff in there. And um, this is, this is a super interesting one to follow. So um, thanks for everything that you do, Doug and the Alberta Conservation Association, and you guys do great work. Well, thanks, Mark. Appreciate it.